Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis using the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 a month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of The Silent Men, the original air date. May the 21st, 1952, and the title is Sabotage. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. The events about to be related took place in 1943, and only recently have we received permission to pass them on to you. May 1943. A stunned America is learning that defeat in war is possible. The enemy is striking telling blows, not only on the battlefield, but here at home. Acts of sabotage are becoming bolder, more frequent. This story tells of the near-successful attempt to destroy the Atlantic fleet as it lay at anchor in the Hudson River. In this reenactment, I will play the role of Special Agent Eric Madden, a file case entitled Sabotage, in which only the names and places are fictional. <laughs> All federal agencies have been called in to fight the deadly effectiveness of the saboteur. Enemy aliens and their sympathizers are under constant watch. Federal special agents are planted in the factories they work, the meeting places they gather, the restaurants they eat in. Because of a facility with European languages, I've been assigned to cover Ludo's Cafe in Brooklyn, a known hangout for undesirables. I have a job there as a waiter. In the six weeks I'd worked at Ludo's, I'd made many acquaintances. One of them, Mr. Stephen Hoyt, was coming toward me now. Good evening, Eric. Good evening, Mr. Hoyt. I'm expecting friends to meet me here soon. Yes, sir. You will serve us? Yes, sir. Good. I'll take one of the back rooms. Hoyt was one of the frequenters of Ludo's Cafe, who was under constant surveillance by federal agents. His long criminal record had put him on the preferred lists of those suspected of having contact with the enemy underground. I carried some menus over to his booth. Menu? Eric, uh, when my friends join me, see that the booths around us are kept empty. Well, the rush is over. That that should be possible. Uh, You may bring me some coffee while I wait. Yes, sir. When I returned to his table, Hoyt had been joined by two friends. A woman in her late thirties and a short, heavy-set man with a thick European accent. They were deep in conversation when I set Mr. Hoyt's coffee down. Thank you, Eric. One more kind of photograph and I can finish the map. Be quiet, Kurt. There is someone standing by. Oh, that gives us 30 hours of ample time. Kurt, you talk too much. Ah, oh, you're worried too much, Martha. The public place affords most privacy. You should know that. Waiter. Bring us three of your cold plate specials. Oh, no, I would prefer something hot day after day, those cursed cans. Three cold plate specials. Quickly, please. Every time I approached the table during the meal, the woman would throw a hard warning glance at the men and the talk would stop. But for all her caution, I overheard enough to justify my slipping outside and making contact with Bill Taylor, the special agent who'd been assigned to tail Hoyt. 
He was leaning against a light pole a couple of hundred feet away from Ludo's. Aye. Follow me around the corner. Yeah. What's up? A man and a woman having supper with Hoyt. Follow them when they leave. All right, but why? Mm, bits of talk I heard. Something about photographs and maps. Something to do with the Hudson River. Well, it doesn't sound like much to me. Well, I can't explain now. The girl's wearing a green cloth coat. The guy will probably be with her. You make it sound pretty urgent. I've got a feeling it is. When I got back to Hoyt's table, his two friends were just about ready to leave. Then you understand clearly what you're to do. Yes, yeah, madame, clearly. Well, what do you want? Uh, to clean up the table, miss. I do not like a waiter who walks so you do not hear him. I told you Eric was all right, Martha. Udo would not have him if he would. Come, Kurt. <laughs> Charming lady, now, Eric. Yeah, woman with a purpose, I'd say, Mr. Hoyt. Yeah, she pays well, which is the best I can say for her. Well, here's something for you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I would be very happy to think that you had forgotten this incident about me dining with a lady and her friend. I've been deaf, dumb, and blind. I had arranged for Bill Taylor to meet me at my apartment when I got home. He was there waiting for me when I came in shortly after midnight. Hi. Come on in. Make yourself at home. Thanks. <laughs> Care for a drink of your scotch? Oh, you found it. Good. Yeah. The uh, girl lives at the Pelham Apartments, 509. The guy went in with her and they stayed about 20 minutes and I followed him home. How she registered at Pelham? <laughs> this is going to knock you for a loop. Go on. She's registered as Mrs. Hoyt. Mrs. Stephen Hoyt. <laughs> it's a front. He's fronting for her. How about Kurt? Had quite a time following him to his place. What a place. Where? The foot of Baxter Street on the Hudson River. Lives on the top floor of an old boathouse. Well, it's shaping up into something. I wish I knew what. Yeah, a broken down old boathouse, but it's storing a beautiful high-speed motor launch. Got its registry number written down here someplace. I'd like to know who owns it. No, I did that while I was waiting for you. Well? Owned by a Mrs. Stephen Hoyt, the same one. 509 Pelham Apartments. I don't like it. Well, I said my piece. Now it's your turn. Things they said at the restaurant. I jotted them down afterwards. I'll read them to you. I'm ready. One more photograph and I can finish the map. La Bette arrives at 2 a.m. 30 hours. That will give us ample time. The explosions will be almost simultaneous. That well, might mean an awful lot. Or nothing. I wonder what they mean by Le Bet will arrive at 2 a.m. Yeah. Where does Hoyt fit in? He's getting paid for some service he performed. I think tomorrow I'll run a make on Mrs. alias Stephen Hoyt. What about Kurt? We won't find anything on him. Why? I think he's an enemy alien who's been smuggled into this country. Good. Let's pick him up. We pick him up and we may leave someone behind to finish the job. Whatever it is. Yeah, I didn't say anything. Well, 30 hours doesn't give us too much time. Should do if we use it well. Meet me in front of the Pelham Apartments at uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. How's that? Oh, we're going to call on the lady? Shall I bring flowers? No, lots of keys and a jimmy. Next morning, we waited in a doorway across from the Pelham Apartments till Martha came out. She got into a cab and drove away. Second story Taylor, they call me in Sing Sing. Did I tell you what records gave me on Martha? No. Come on. I picked her out from a pile of pictures. Migrated here 14 years ago. Been active in front groups ever since. Nice kid. Should be enough for deportation. Should be, but it isn't. Now, you stay here. Right. I'm going to talk to the apartment manager. Yes, sir. You're in charge? What can I do for you if it's for vacancies? Mm, it isn't. Uh, just take a look at my credentials. 
federal special agent. Well, I assure you, I... Have... Now, relax. It's one of your tenants we're interested in, a Mrs. Stephen Hoyt. Oh, 509. She just left a few minutes ago. I know. Did she say when she'd be back? No. Has she done anything wrong? I always had a feeling about her. Nothing I can explain, mind you, but... This building has an automatic elevator? Uh, press the button on the floor you want, and it goes... Where's back. the control switch? In the basement. Mm-hmm. Look, what's this all about? I'm sorry, ma'am, but for the next half hour, your elevator is going to be out of commission. Anybody comes in, you tell them to walk up. Hmm? You going to search her place? Yep. Well, who'd ever think she'd tangle with the federal agents? What's she done? Mm, maybe nothing. I haven't time to explain now. I never had my shoes for her myself, but to think that She's she... She's not to know we've been here, understand? Not a word to anyone. How do you like that? Anyone would think I'm the type who talks. How do you like that? Five minutes later, we were in Martha's apartment making a quick but thorough search of the place. Not a thing. How about you, Bill? Come here. Well, my lady's dressing room. Yeah, she's been using it for something else. A dark room for developing pictures. Take a look in this wardrobe. Photography equipment. Yeah, high-class stuff. Take a look at this enlarger. Ah. Find any pictures? Not a one. Maybe she doesn't believe in exhibiting her work. Well, let's give the place a going over. You start in the kitchen, I'll work here. Right. Forty-five minutes, we searched the apartment. We found nothing. Not one print. Not one spoiled negative. We put everything in order and left before Martha came back. On the way out, I stopped to ask the apartment manageress a few questions. You done already? Well, what did you find? You happen to know if Mrs. Hoyt is a camera fan? I never noticed. But I'd believe anything you told me about her. How about company? Does she have many visitors? Hardly any. No wonder. Never did see a woman so close mouthed. Kind of cold-like. Lots of calls, telephone calls? Only one that calls regular. They talk together in some foreign language. You handle the switchboard? Say, if you think I got nothing to do but listen in when I put a call through... No, 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 not at all. Besides, I couldn't understand a word they said. You know, Eric, this whole thing's developing into a big nothing. Well, I bet we'll arrive at 2 a.m. If I only knew what that meant. Did you check at headquarters? Yeah, nobody knew. No such town, no such a name means anything. Well, did you report to the chief? Report what? It's a talk I overheard in a restaurant, a hunch that something's wrong with nothing to back it up? (sighs) Even a rookie would know better than that. Yeah, I might look kind of silly at that. Just let's get something to go on and I'll... Then dump it in the chief's lap. In a big hurry. Okay. You be the boss on this one. What do we do now? Go down to Kurt's boathouse and pray that he's not around. Yeah, and what if he is? Then we'll wait till he isn't. I want to take a look around in there. Okay. I got a feeling we're wasting time, but as long as it's official, let's go. parked our car a few blocks from the river's edge and walked down to the shore. We took cover as best we could till we got to an old boathouse that Taylor identified as Kurt's. Now, this is the place. The door's open on the water so they can park the launch inside. There's another door around on the side. Saw somebody walk by the window just now. Kurt, I saw him too. What now? Sit back and wait. Lots of activity in there. Yeah. He's taking the boat out. That's a break. There go the doors. She's loaded down pretty heavy. Kurt and Martha. They're heading out to sea. I wonder what for. We're going to find out soon, I hope. Come on. Let's get inside. Hope there's no one else in there. Well, I don't think so. They wouldn't have locked the doors from the outside. How about this lock? Can you handle it? Sure. Got it. Nothing down here. Let's go upstairs. They 
Kind of eerie in here, isn't it? Yeah. Looks like Kurt has been staying here quite a while. Yeah, quite a work table he's got here. Mm -hmm. Slide rules, compass. Might be used for anything. Drafting, drawing maps. Yeah. What's that? I just kicked them under the table. Shiny pieces of tin. Well, let's see that. Wait a minute. Huh. Looks like a reflector. Now, what would they use these things for? Hey, here's something. Spoiled picture of some kind. Blown up pretty big. Looks like it was taken at night. Those lights, they're, they're reflections on water. Yeah, look like luminous balloons. I think I've got it. Yeah? They look almost like street lamps, don't they? Yeah, a little. And and the space between the lights is the street. Only in this case, it's a water lane. <laughs> You're way ahead of me now. They put reflectors on the boys marking the traffic lane on the river. Then they took pictures of them at night. That's what the glares are. So what does it mean? Well, nothing yet. This gives them only a small section of the river. Should be more pictures around. Maybe a map. Oh, well, these guys don't believe in leaving samples around. Well, let's drop it for now. I have a shortcut in mind. Like what? We'll rent a boat and cruise down the river. Maybe we can catch up with them and get some idea of what they're doing. You know, this is turning out to be quite a picnic. Yeah, quite a picnic. For an hour, we cruised the river in a rented boat looking for Kurt and Mark. But we did not locate them. We were set to turn back when a small Coast Guard patrol boat bore down on us. A man on board signaled us to stop. We cut our motors and he came up alongside. What do you guys think you're doing out here? Been watching you for 20 minutes. These boys set out here near the mouth of the river. Do they mean anything special? This is a Navy area, bud. It isn't smart to ask those kind of questions. We're federal men. Tracking down a lead, officer. What kind of lead? You security guys will drive me nuts yet. Hey, does the word Labette mean anything to you? Is it the name of a ship? Naval intelligence gives out all information about ships. You know of anything that's due to happen out here sometime early tomorrow morning, 2 a.m.? Look, I got one job, to patrol this area. Federal men or not, you better get moving. This is urgent, officer. Well, then contact Naval Intelligence, like I told you. We may not have time. Can you tell us of any special activity that's to take place around here in the next 24 hours? Check with the proper authorities. I got one job, to patrol the traffic lane. Look, officer... Maybe you should get in touch with someone in authority and tell them to be on the alert for trouble. What kind of trouble? Where? In this area. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll get in touch with the Admiral right away. Okay, Pete. Let's get rolling. You guys have better get going, too. Who the one that guy thinks we're screwballs? I'm beginning to think he's right. What time you got, Bill? Quarter past seven. You gonna call the chief? One more visit to Kurtz and I'll call the chief. Trouble is, I got nothing to tell him. What do you hope to find in the boathouse, sir? Uh, you're great on asking questions I can't answer. Supposing Kurt and Martha are there? Then I'll call the chief and let him take over. We moored the boat around a bend in the river and walked back to the ramshackle old boathouse. Kurt and Martha had not come back. We got into the building and started another search in Kurt's room. In the inside pocket of one of Kurt's jackets hanging in an improvised closet, I found a piece of paper with some intricate markings on it. Hey, what do you got there? Well, it looks like a mechanical drawing. This part on top here looks like some kind of timing device. Hey, it's a time fuse, Eric. And this bottom portion here must be a... a depth bomb. A bomb? You kidding? Hey, Eric, you don't think they're going to try to... It's time to bring some help in. Lots of it. Get out and call the chief right away. What about you? I'll stay here till you get back. Now move. You're planning to bomb our ships right here in New York Harbor? This gives me the shakes. You wouldn't think in a million years... Get that... going and tell the chief to call Naval Intelligence. Quick. Bill had no sooner started down the stairs when I heard the sound of a boat coming in toward the boathouse. For a minute, I thought they must have met out there, Taylor and Kurt. But it was quiet outside, and I breathed easier. 
I looked around for a place to hide. There was none. I figured I'd drop out of the window to the ground below. I moved quickly toward it and lifted the sash. I saw her standing below the window, a gun in her hand. Martha. I would not try that if I were you. I heard steps behind me, and I spun around. Kurt stood there. Your hands over your head. Hi. You move and I'll shoot you where you stand. Now, turn around slowly. All right, Martha. You can come up now. Your timing's poor, Kurt. You're too late. <laughs> the waiter who served us last night. Hoyt's friend. And a federal agent. Uh, an agent in Luther's? You're learning from us? <laughs> in ten minutes, we'll have 50 men here. You're no doubt referring to your friend who went to summon help. He won't. We met him outside. We knew then there might be another one upstairs. And well, we cannot keep them here. Uh -huh. We will remove them. With a couple of bullets, I should remove them permanently. Put a gag on him so he can make no noise when he is in the boat. <laughs> Kurt tied me, then half shoved me, half carried me down the steps to the boat. I was not alone. Taylor lay on the floor beside me, bound and gagged as I was. They started the motor and we backed out into the channel. Fifteen minutes later, we drifted into another boathouse. We were unloaded from the launch and taken into a back room. Take the gags off. They may yell all they want. Nobody will hear them now. Why do you stare, Mr. Rater? <laughs> He is looking at your depth bombs, Kurt. Hmm. You should have seen them when they were all lined up against the wall. The 14 of them. Now only three remain, and soon they will be out to welcome the Atlantic fleet. The Atlantic fleet? You did not know. The Atlantic fleet is coming in to anchor early this morning. These bombs will be there ready to greet them. Attached to the anchor boys. You think you're going to get away with this? Of course. That's well planned, and it will be well executed. You see, even you, an American federal agent, you did not know that your fleet is anchoring this morning. Laybet will arrive at 2 a.m. A ship? Our name for the flagship, the Centaur. The one carrying Admiral Penai. That's 10 o'clock, Martha. We better go. I can quickly dispose of these two. We will wait till Mr. Hoyt arrives. He will watch them till we get back. That fool? Guard these men? It is his life or theirs. He will guard them. We watched Kurt load the three remaining bombs on the launch. It was almost incredible to believe that each of these monsters might soon sink an American fighting ship at anchor in home waters. Kurt had tied us securely to a couple of wood-backed chairs. He and Martha went about their work on the launch. If only I could work my hands loose. I messed this one up, Bill. I should have brought the department in a long time ago. Yeah, how many people do you think will believe this, Eric? It's like a nightmare. <sighs> I've got to know the ships were coming in. How? Well, the Japs had help at Pearl Harbor, too. Maybe Hoyt. That scares you. It scares you silly. Keep trying to work your hands loose. Yeah. If one of us does, whistle. That'll be the tip off. All right. Uh, I forgot to tell you, the bombs were made completely of American materials. Fine. That is Hoyt. I will let him in. Come in. Meet a friend of yours. Eric. Yeah. A federal special agent. As is his friend. Oh, you're crazy. Ludo told me himself. Ludo that he... was a fool, as you are. What, what are you going to do with them? If they live, you die. Give me my money. I want to get out of here. You must watch them till we get back. Then you will be paid. I do no killing. You understand? I do no killing. We will look after everything ourselves. Kurt, give him your gun. Yeah. Here. Use it if you have to. I have no choice. That is exactly correct. You have no choice. <laughs> They left with their load of depth bombs. I started working on the ropes that tied my hands to the back of the chair. 
My hands were sore and blistering, but I began to feel little frayed strands of rope that told me I was making some headway. Half past eleven. They should have been back. Our men probably have them by now. You're next. Shut up. You're lying. Why don't you untie us? It'll go a lot easier for you. Yeah. Fifteen years instead of life. You know what these people are trying to do? Thousands of American kids out there... Save it. You can buy and wave a lot of flags for the dough I'm making tonight. What some guys won't do for a buck, huh? Makes you want... Stow it. Shut up. I mean it. Look, we still got time to stop it. If the fleet's coming in at 2 a.m., we... Listen up, I said. All right, cut that out. Nobody can hear you anyways. Uh, all right. Can I have a drink of water? Yeah. Nothing funny, though. I'll drop you. Got your hands free. Get him to stand in front of him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll feed it to you. I'm not untying your hands. Okay. Well, stand a little in front of me, will you, so I can get at the cup? Yeah. I got Taylor free, and then we tied Hoyt up and left him lying on the floor. Using a little forceful persuasion, we learned from him that he had tipped Martha office to the exact movements of the fleet. It was due in less than an hour. No time for phone calls now. Only one thing to do. Stop one of the scouting ships as it came in. We borrowed a motorboat, which was moored nearby. You wouldn't think they could get the bombs through all the patrols, would you? They had it timed down to seconds. Hoyt said they'd been working on this thing for five months. <laughs> Seven million people in New York. How many of them would believe it? We should be pretty close now. Yeah. I think I see one of the boys. Yeah, make sure you don't hit any of them. You know what it'll mean if you did. Hey, did you hear that? Yeah, a destroyer signal. On time. They had the fleet movements figured out to the minute. You think we can get to her in time? Yeah, she's still quite a way out. Yeah. Look, there's a boat coming toward us. Maybe it's a patrol boat. Slow down. They can get out to the fleet faster than we can. Hey, that's no patrol boat. It's Kurt and Martha. Give her all the speed she'll take. All right. Can't bother with them now. She sees us. They won't let us through. They're trying to block the channel. What'll I do? Go right for her. Either she moves or we ram her. Get down again. We've got to get through. They're forcing us over toward the buoys. Ram them. She's moving out of our way. We might make it. Pull your wheel over hard. Yeah. Oh, that was close. She's heading to one of the Anchorage boys. Bill, if she hits it, Kurt and Martha were destroyed by one of their own weapons. And, ironically enough, the very explosion that took their lives was what halted the fleet as it steamed into anchor. In less than an hour, the remaining bombs were located and detonated. Later that morning, we made our reports to a group of naval intelligence officers and the heads of many branches of our federal government. Stephen Hoyt admitted his part in what might have almost been the second Pearl Harbor. And to the skeptics who think America is invulnerable to attack, who think we can sit it out in a neutral corner. This story is a grim reminder that it did happen here. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The failure of the Hudson River bomb plot closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving widespread counterfeiting on the eastern seaboard in a file case entitled The Green Sedan, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Sabotage was written by Lewis and Russoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in our cast were Paul Fries, Bill Conrad, Joan Banks, Ben Wright, and Ruth Parrott. Your announcer is Don Stanley. 
Douglas Fairbanks is currently presenting Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emmeline Williams in the motion picture, Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Follow the campaign of the next president on NBC, the national broadcasting company. Welcome back. Well, an interesting episode, kind of different in that uh, the uh, episodes of the silent men had essentially been in more contemporary uh, post times, but it doesn't seem extraordinary that uh, this sort of story would take, you know, nine years to uh, be declassified. And the whole situation of World War II spy rings is a kind of an interesting one. The propaganda and the fiction at the time essentially acted like, you know, you couldn't go you know, more than a few feet without stumbling over a uh, Nazi spy ring. So many characters ended up, you know, in fiction, ended up stumbling into these rings and having to fight them. I mean, Laurel and Hardy ended up fighting the Nazis, uh, for crying out loud. But, of course, the reality was that there were some very sophisticated uh, groups of Axis spies at work in the United States with some very nefarious schemes, the full extent of which the government couldn't let be known until years later. Find their idea of leaving the guy who didn't uh, like uh, violence to guard the prisoners to be a somewhat odd decision. It seems like uh, one of the uh, ruthless uh, spies should have stayed behind and uh, conscripted the mob boss uh, for other work on their plan. But, you know, it was World War II. It was hard to find good help, I guess, particularly if you were the Axis working behind the enemy lines. Now to listener comments and feedback, and we have a couple on Instagram. Uh, this one comes from Farmer Brown Grows. He writes, Love being able to catch your podcast when I really don't want to watch anything. Laying in the hammock at night, surrounded by dogs, we all enjoy several episodes. Well, thanks so much, uh, and appreciate the comments, and it's one time where uh, I found out that uh, the program's gone to the dogs, and I don't mind at all. Glad the dogs enjoyed as well. And uh, then uh, we had a comment on the video theater episode of uh, Man with a Camera, uh, Turntable, uh, and Four String Samurai 7 writes, Charles Bronson looks like he was literally born to smack people around. Well, who can argue with that? All right, well, now I do want to go ahead and thank our uh, Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Judith, Patreon supporter since March of 2016, currently supporting the show at the uh, Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Judith. And that will do it for today. Join us back here on Monday for Casey Crime Photographer. Thursday, we're going to get into some previously uncirculated episodes of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. And then next Saturday, our final episode of The Silent Men. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.